Yeah? So, um, hello everybody. My name is <laughs> Daniel. There are trains passing by. <laughs> you have some editing work, I think. Um, anyway, the, um, uh, so I, I am uh, based in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, I have spent uh, my childhood in Belgium, so I, uh, I, I still understand uh, uh, both French and Dutch. Uh, I didn't come here for 10 years, and I just came back after 10 years, so it was a big, uh, big, big trip. And um, I, I can still understand everything, so that's fantastic. Um, so uh, I'm the founder and organizer of the Closure Meter uh, Group in Tel Aviv, and um, we do this for two years now. Um, we have uh, on and off attendance uh, um, uh, intensity, like uh, we have a lot of people that registered. I'm not completely happy with uh, how many people show up. Uh, I, Maybe it's my fault. I don't know, uh, but it's uh, it's not always easy to to push uh, closure. Uh, at least in Tel Aviv, there are uh, lots of mainstream languages which are really firmly um, um, rooted, and it's a bit difficult to find uh, a place for for closure. Um, besides that, I have. Uh, um, a product which I run as a service, um, and this is how I uh, make my uh, our, m the breadwinner. Uh, we also, during our meetups, we always do a kind of a introduction round where everybody says his name and what he's doing. So maybe we can do this as well because we are a small forum. Yeah. Okay, so um, a little bit about, about the talk itself. Uh, we're gonna talk about interactive programming. And we're going to make a kind of a detour. Uh, it's going to be technical at the end, uh, but before that, it will be more philosophical. Why? Um, that's also uh, something that uh, I would like to um, encourage you to also interact with me, because it's uh, not only because it's interactive programming; it can be an interactive uh, session. Uh, so, um, why philosophy, uh, or why philosophical uh, in the beginning? Because simply there is no science without philosophy. Uh, science without philosophy is just science that has a philosophy which, or philosophical princ principles which have not been examined. That's actually a quote which I'm probably misquoting, but that's, that's the idea. Um, so, we're going to start with a riddle. It's a localized riddle. Hello. Hello. You're just in time for the riddle. <laughs> so uh, Peter is looking at Mika, and Mika is looking at Jan. Peter is married, but Jan is not. He's a married person looking at an unmarried person. I'll leave you think, to think about it for like half a minute, 30 seconds. Okay, so Three, three possibilities, yes, uh, no, or there is not enough information to derive the correct answer. So what's it going to be? Who says uh, yes? Le who says uh, no? And who says there is not enough information to derive the correct answer? Okay, so it's really four against four, right? That's pretty good. Uh, who knew the riddle? Nobody? Okay, so the actual answer is yes. Uh, the people who said yes can be proud of themselves. Um, the people who said uh, there is not enough, enough information to derive the correct answer uh, can also be happy with themselves because this is what most people say. Uh, and the reason, the reason for this, maybe uh, who's, the people who said yes can explain. So who wants to explain why it's yes? Yeah? 
you substitute either of the two possibilities in the middle person, exactly. both, in both uh, cases, exactly. the constraints are satisfied. Exactly. But so the question is if you, yeah, it's okay. Because yeah. Mika, if she's married or not, makes, it, makes the statement true. I, either way, it's like it's so. Uh, so that's exactly it. And uh, the <laughs> the thing is that the the, the reason why most people uh, would say there is not enough information uh, to derive the correct answer is because uh, we are our brain is is doing heuristics. It's it's not uh, always considering a problem with the the whole logical capab capability that we have. Um, but we are we're going fast uh, to 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 um, uh, make decisions about this stuff, and we need to do that to survive. We can't always contemplate all possi everything in life; uh, otherwise, we are being <laughs> eaten by a, by a lion and or, or or whatever. It's like we need heuristics to survive. It's a it's a survival thing. So. It, it is so, um, it's kind of funny or sad or whatever you want to, the, it doesn't matter how you look at it, but it's true that uh, for everyday reasoning, we use very little logic. And uh, there's, there's a lot, tons of experiments that, that, um, uh, that show us that. And this, this, this riddle is, comes from uh, these this kinds of experiments, experiments that, that are uh, being made. They are, they are called ways and tasks, and there are many of them. And they always show the same thing. People going for an answer, which is the, the seemingly correct answer, very fast. But actual, actually, uh, if, they, if you tell them to think about the problem, uh, they, will, they will understand that there is uh, a different answer, which is correct. <coughs> so uh, who knows Daniel Kahneman? Yeah? OK. So. Um, uh, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he's been uh, doing uh, work in uh, psychology and, 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 and uh, philosophy and economics, uh, kind of cross-discipline, cross a uh, very interesting guy. And he, he wrote a book uh, called Thinking Fast and Slow. And um, he explains why, he, he can explain as well why um, um, we, we behave or how our brain behaves, and he explains this to um, the two the two systems of the brain. The brain can work according to system one and system two. System one is the thinking that is fast, intuitive, and unaware of its workings, and system two is the slow thinking, able to correct systems one mistakes, which is exactly uh, what we did before with the riddle. Although some people used system two, some people use system one. Uh, but when we program, uh, what, what, are we, what are we using? Which, which one is it that, we, that we're using? System one or system two? System one, if you're in front of the screen. System two, where you're in the shower or on the toilet and <laughs> finding out bugs. OK, exactly. Uh, somebody else? Yeah, somebody thinks otherwise? or. So it's, it's actually very true. It's like we use both. We use, um, uh, w when we learn or we, 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 uh, we deal with a difficult part of the program, we use system uh, two. But most of the time, we try to maximize system one. Like uh, we know already the language. We know uh, the problem domain. We need to pump, pump out code. And we just do what we do best. And we don't need to think very, 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 uh, very hard. So. Um, we do also a lot of mistakes because for for some uh, you know in some languages uh, order of evaluation is tricky uh, precedence pre uh, the how, how do you call this the precedence you operator precedence rules it's a it's a if you really actually look at it it's like a table with so many possibilities and you just uh, you can't you can't keep this in your in your head. We do mistakes all the time. Um, so the the thing is that you have to accept um, that we make that you make mistakes, and you have to devise strategies to to go around these mistakes. Now, um, I think you know where I'm going, uh, 
And if not, uh, I will tell you. But um, uh, the thing is that there are man many strategies. Uh, and sometimes in our um, uh, education, we are being taught that one strategy is better than the others. Now, that is why I, this slide is called epistem epistem epistemological uh, pluralism, uh, because um, I actually believe that uh, there are many different cases, and it can also be uh, dependent on people. There are some people who function in in some some ways um, in, in, when they solve problems, which are totally um, not compatible with other people's. Uh, the problem is when there is one one way which is declared the way. For example, for some in the 70s, I think the waterfall way was. This is how you produce software, you, it's analytical, you break down the problem, you do planning, and um, fortunately, we, are, we, live, we live in a different time, and uh, we are much more tolerant, I think, today with uh, different approaches, but uh, it's, it's, it might be still an issue for some people, it depends. Uh, it depends from where, where you are and what your experience is. In, in any case, uh, if, if you're interested in this kind of uh, subject, I'm just going to mention this paper by uh, Samuel Papert, which is a famous guy uh, who did the Logo Turtle uh, programming language for the kids. And he has a, a paper called Epistemological, Epistemological Pluralism and the Revalu Revaluation of the Concrete. Uh, and the whole uh, approach is called uh, Constructionism. And it's, it's uh, basically... It, uh, it, it promotes the idea of playing around with, with concepts when you solve problems, instead of analyzing it, instead of uh, the, the, the traditional analytical uh, approach. They had a big effect on uh, society and on, the, on uh, education. Uh, until today, uh, K-12 program in America is, inspired, it's, uh, is influenced by this. Uh, or by, by the principles. But w when we talk about programming um, and uh, strategies to, 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 uh, to program, we can think about um, the properties we want. Um, and uh, if you look at these properties, uh, testability, reactivity, incrementality, and immediacy, um, you get the, the idea uh, of a interactive programming session. It makes sense to want to, to program interactively instead of um, whatever it is that you're doing. And um, uh, uh, interactive programming um, allows all kinds of things uh, like bottom-up programming, uh, domain exploration, uh, bricolage, which is a concept from Papert um, and prototyping, um, if you've seen the videos from Brett, Brett Victor, anybody familiar? No? You want to, to maybe? Oh, you heard. I think this is one way to simulate. He made a game where you could yes, see, yes. Uh, see what, uh, how the program it was. Uh, yes. You could simulate how it would move uh, the, the guy in the game. Uh, exactly. If you haven't seen the, the, the videos by Brett Victor, it's very recommended. Yes. Yes, these are in principle, and he has actually a lot uh, of other projects and, and demos uh, that you can look up. In general, it's always very interesting, and he shows always. Um, he, he has a very very strong uh, emphasis on uh, interactive programming uh, in ways which is not always possible today. But uh, that's why it's also interesting. So a definition: um, what, what is inter interactive programming? Um, well, it's 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 really this. It's um, it's interactive programming is a procedure of writing parts of a program while it is already active. Okay, that that is interactive programming. Now, um, what, what it means in in practice is that um, you have an environment uh, provided by the REPL, and you 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 uh, you redefine elements like functions uh, and, and, and methods and variables. Um, you, can, you can evaluate uh, any, any expression, test them. Um, you can load files containing uh, source code. Um, 
you you basically have a real inside inside mirror in in the, in the program, and uh, you can take it the anywhere any direction you want, so so as to to make either. Uh, uh, expand on your program or uh, explore it or debug it or, or whatever. It's a very powerful methodology um, uh, in terms of uh, interactive programming. Now I'm going to, I'm going to mention a couple of uh, things which are uh, also around, around the topic. Um, the, um, there is a paper from 1978 uh, which um, Examines what uh, what what can, how a language should look like if it enables pr uh, interactive program because clearly uh, not you know there is a problem when when your when your language is compiled to to do interactive programming so it's basically interactive programming is the is a privilege of uh, dynamic languages so uh, but but not any dynamic languages you need to fulfill a couple of um, requirements in order for your dynamic programming language to enable interactive programming, right? So th this paper looks at it, but it looks at it uh, in 1978, and the, the terms it, it comes up with are a bit um, dated. Um, I'm just putting them here, it's not really important. Uh, what is important, though, is the next slide, where it says that the kernel of the programming system must contain the following pro programs. A parser, a program printer, an interpreter, and our compiler. This, this, according to this paper, is needed in, an, in, an, in a dynamic interactive pro uh, language to enable interactive programming. But can, can somebody rec recognize in these elements um, a pattern? That is that is the pattern. Here, here's your your parser. Here's your your printer. Here's your evaluator. And and just just a loop. This is a classical definition of a REPL, right? So, uh, the REPL has um, in in Lisp in traditional Lisp programs a couple of um, properties which you all, which will you will always find any 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 scheme scheme uh, or, or Lisp language has it uh, in, and that is the history of inputs and outputs the variables for last result or, or the and the last error help and documentation for commands and then some variables to control the reader and the printer Okay, um, you will find this in any any kind of uh, Lisp wrapper. Now, uh, one question that I'm going to mention, uh, one question that I'm going to mention very uh, uh, rapidly is, um, it, okay, but is is a wrapper something really uh, exclusive to to Lisp languages? And the answer is no, absolutely not. You have uh, you have REPLs in uh, many other dynamic languages. If you've done Python or Ruby, you know that you you might use a, a, a REPL all the time. <coughs> and yet, there is something in Lisp languages that makes the REPL experience a bit different. Uh, but that's not because of the REPL. That's because of the environment. A, a REPL is not enough to to have a really good uh, experience. Uh, you need an environment. In, in common list, the environment is called slime. Um, an environment is what. <laughs> uh, the environment is what allows you to, you know, to send your the evaluation of, of a line of code in your source file to the REPL without having to copy and paste it, for example, because uh, uh, what we said about the REPL is that it's just uh, this uh, command line. Uh, that doesn't give you the facility to interact from your source file, right? So you need to, to have something else. Um, and, um, and that's the environment provides that. Now, again, there are many environments for many different languages. Um, and um, you might be fam familiar with some. Emacs is the is the environment for the Emacs Lisp uh, inside 
inside the, the, the editor. For Scheme, you have something called Geyser. Um, uh, Cider is the closure environment, uh, wrapper environment. And you have also non lisp environments. And one of the best examples is the small talk, which has inf influenced uh, the, the, uh, computing um, the history of computing science uh, in, in a very uh, significant way. It was an amazing environment. Uh, if, if you can still download it and try it out. Um, extremely interactive and uh, everything is inspectable and everything is also image based so you can always restore the program state uh, from any kind of uh, past um, state um, and it's a very inspiring environment now, now we can finally uh, uh, examine the closure environment uh, a little bit more a, bit, a, little, bit, a little bit closer um, so in closure, the environment is called cider, right? Everybody's familiar with. Uh, I mean, in closure. I mean, in in uh, in uh, for some clo <laughs> for some closureians, it's cider. Uh, who who is using cider? One, two. That's it. Everybody else uses something else. Okay. What are you using? Cursive. Okay. Cursive. 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 Okay. So. Um, as you see, I'm a bit of a dictator, but um, uh, <laughs> it's 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 not what I mean. Uh, I think uh, most it's it's um, most of what uh, we are going to discuss is valid also in different uh, environments. But your mileage may, may may vary. It's just that I'm using cider, and uh, I take this as a reference environment. Um, so you you know that in in closure. Um, uh, you have a, a REPL, uh, you want to um, redefine parts of the program while, while it is active, that is the definition of interactive programming, right? So uh, wh one thing you, you don't want to do is restart the runtime, right? That's something you never want to do that. Also, um, uh, actually, why don't you want to do that? So just one comment, uh, the JVM is too slow, that is exactly what I would have said as well. But actually, in order to be uh, a little bit more precise, uh, it's not only, the JVM is maybe not so slow, it's the closure bootstraps itself in the JVM every time you restart uh, your program. So, uh, so we know that we want to keep our runtime, but we want to restart the application, right? So how do we start, uh, or, or, or whatever? I mean, we have a function. We we redefine the function. Uh, wh how 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 do you do this in in, uh, in in cursive? Just redefining a function. Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, obviously, I'm using uh, components as well, like to, to restart. The stuff. Right. But uh, let's say that, for instance, you have a. Uh, a web application running, uh, what you do is you can connect to the REPL from Cursive. Uh, either you start your application from the REPL in Cursive or you connect to an external one through NREPL and then you can just reload an entire file for instance or one function into the REPL and it uh, updates your code in the running web application. Okay, and that is exactly what we're going to look into it. So. Um, we know we, we can do that, but how, do, how does it happen? How does it work? Um, Trojan has built-in facilities to uh, redefine uh, functionality in, in an application. And, and th that built-in facility is the uh, reload uh, keyword that you add when you require a namespace. Okay, So basically, um, I'm going to ask a question here. Is it, is it enough? It's like, OK, we have require and then a reload. Maybe we can just uh, always use this. Uh, can we? Depends on the state of your program and what you change, right? Yes. If you have a function that you're redefining your calls, you might have new behavior for the new version of the function, so it's propagates to. Yes. For example, if you display a GUI and you display a button function, but then you redefine it to display a drop down. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so propagation. Okay, yes, that's that's also true. So um, we, we're gonna do we're gonna go through the problems of this approach uh, in a systematic way. It's uh, something that is uh, taken from the um, tools namespace uh, readme. Uh, it lists all the errors that you will have uh, if you just use require and reload. So. One constraint, you, if you modify two namespaces which depend on each other, you must remember to, re to re reload them in the correct order to avoid compilation errors. Another problem, if you remove definitions from a source file and then reload it, those, those definitions are still available in memory. I, maybe you've, you've encountered this problem before. That is a classical example. You, you just uh, uh, removed a definition of a function, but it's still there. And you forget it's still there, and then uh, everything works, and then you restart the, the, job, the JVM and it stops working. And you don't know why. Okay, there is a problem with def multi. Um, you need to, to reload all the associated def method expressions. If uh, a reloaded namespace contains uh, protocols, then you must, you must reload any records or types implementing that protocol and replace any existing instances of those records with new instances. So clearly, I mean, we can go on. If the reloaded namespace contains macros, you must also reload any namespace which use those macros. So clearly, uh, uh, require and reload with the reload keyword is not, is not enough because it's a headache if you, if you, uh, if you want to um, reset your application um, in an in a, in a easy way. So there is one solution for that, and that's Tools Namespace. It's a library that uh, was written by um, Stuart Sierra. Um, and it has a single API it's called ref that, calls, that, is, that is named Refresh, and it takes care of everything uh, that we mentioned now. Everything. So, uh, how does it work? It's uh, the refresh function will scan the directories uh, of your on, on of your source files, read the NS declarations, build a graph of their dependencies, and load them in dependency order. And then it does something else as well. Maybe somebody has an idea. That's very important. It will unload, it will re remove the namespaces that changed to clear out any, any definitions. That is, that is paramount. So if you have uh, the, the, the tools uh, namespace um, uh, library in your project, you, in your application, you could build something like that. You require it, you, ref you, uh, you, you, you call refresh, and then you start your application. I mean, that is something that will clean, clean every, every time you make changes in your, in your, in your source files, you, you could you know, do this, this sequence of uh, commands, and you have a clean state, um, or you have a clean application. At least you don't have the problems that we mentioned before. You can also have a stop um, sequence. And is that it? What, if we would uh, uh, use, use this, uh, what, what kind of problems do we still have? Can you, do you know? Yes, so you, you lose global state. That is absolutely true. You lose global state. So that is, that is one thing. But you might adapt to this, right? You can say, I, I construct my state when I relaunch the application dynamically, right? What else? What, are, what other problems might we have uh, with, with this? Up, uh, um, we have two, two more problems. We have one, one other problem is that you need to make sure that this is called from uh, known. No, uh, uh, no namespaces that belong to your application. Why? Because it, 
it gets reloaded, it gets uh, removed at every time. It, you lose all your namespaces. That is one thing. But you can put them in user, right? And then call them from user. But, and then there is another problem, which, are, which is related to state, to the state problem that you mentioned. Um, and that is the external resources. Uh, when your application uses uh, sockets or files, or databases, that also gets um, re removed. Get the Sorry? The so um, this is this is this is. Uh, it, 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 wait, stop. So uh, theoretically, yes, you could you could put this in your stop. Of course, depends what the stop is doing. We don't know what it's doing. So if it handles both your application and the external resources, then it's okay. But uh, there is a better solution. I mean, or the, there is a solution which is based on, on, on this, and that is the, the reloaded pattern, uh, which is exactly uh, the tool's namespace, refresh uh, functionality, API call, plus the lifecycle protocol. So this, this kind of, si the, the commands that we've seen to start and to stop the application, but formalized in a protocol. So the protocol just um, has two methods, start and stop, and you, you make a function which uh, implements this, this protocol, which starts and stops your application and has to uh, create the, the state that you, that you need for your application and also the, the external resources. Everything needs to be um, in, in, that, in that function. <clears throat> uh, Stuart Sia wrote a blog post and explained this, this, uh, this uh, um, approach in, uh, extensively. Um, it was in thir yeah, 2013, so that was three years ago. Uh, it, it had a, a big impact on the closure community, and every th everybody thought, yes, this is the correct way to build applications. Um, this gives us uh, truly restartable applications. Uh, this, this gives us testability. This gives this good discipline. This is best practices. This is what we want. So. Little by little, uh, the, the ecosystem around this uh, uh, got got uh, uh, shaped. Uh, the first the first thing that that happened is uh, Stuart Searides himself, who produced a library called Component, and uh, it's it's the Component is just a library which gives you the lifecycle protocol that you can uh, integrate with your. Um, in your in your workflow, any kind of uh, external resource can be made into a component, and you you declare them, and you declare what component depends on what. It's a this dependency in injection kind of library, <coughs> and then in the end, you you have one function that does the instantiation of all the components which are stored in a graph, and it does it in the order that you 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 declared. And it's a neat, it's a neat way to to work. Um, <coughs> since this was the infrastructure, um, uh, it was kind of straightforward to 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 concentrate the uh, components for external resources into a, a repository and make them available to the community, because. Once you define a component for a database, like for example, uh, you know, uh, Postgres, it, it, any, anybody else who, who is going to make the component for Postgres is going to, to have the same, has, has to go, he will have to go to the same thing. So why not make a public repository um, backed by the community of, uh, of um, resources we, use, we usually use? And that is what system, uh, this is how system, which is library that uh, I started, got started. Um, and it has uh, all, all these um, uh, components uh, available. Um, if you have something in mind, uh, if, if you need something that you don't see there, then you just push a, a, a pull request 
I'd, I'd be happy to, to merge uh, anything contributed. And half of them was contributed. Um, and then everything was fine, but uh, at the time we, we were using Leiningen and uh, it, was, it was not unusual to have um, like three, three JVM instances on your machine on one project because you, you would have uh, the REPL where you start and stop the system, okay, where you use the, the reloaded pattern, but then you, you also need some kind of a, um, a CLGS build if you do web. Um, line fig wheel, which is uh, in the beginning was only doing, I think, was only doing the hot reloading. Now it's also doing the building, so you can, you know, you can um, spare the the, the CLG, CLGS build. But still, uh, if you don't pay attention, uh, any line command also uh, launches uh, spawns two instances, two instances of the JVM. Uh, because this is how Linigan works, so you need to use trampoline. So it was not—it was not unusual to have four JVM. Just you know, it, it was kind of crazy for machines. Depends on on, on what you you have at work, but um, for the, uh, development machines with um, constrained memory, it, it can it could be a bit uh, uh, heavy, uh, and that that got solved as well um, with boot. Uh, it's a build system. Who has heard of boot? Okay, that's good. Almost everybody. Um, uh, boot is a radically different uh, uh, build system. It's based on middleware, the idea of middleware, like in Ring, uh, where you def and every task uh, builds, uh, is aligned into a pipeline, and you, uh, you're using only one JVM instance. In this uh, example, we have the same functionality as uh, the previous uh, example, but there we have uh, three or, or, or more uh, JVMs. Here, the reload task is doing what the fig wheel is doing. CLGS is doing the what CLGS build is doing, and the REPL is, is the line REPL. <coughs> but it's all neatly into one one uh, JVM instance. <coughs> So um, the way you use system is uh, you, you uh, declare uh, your components. Uh, this is um, um, a word by word um, adaptation of uh, the component library. This is how you do it in the component library. Uh, this is a, um, a macro, a convenience macro from the system library. But um, it's it's just uh, it's it it um, compiles to the same uh, syntax as the uh, component library, which is uh, system using I think something like that. And boot system is the um, task, the boot task for system that you can use inside boot. Um, this is. A real example of uh, an application which has a, a CLGS um, component to it, um, and the nice thing here is that your system is declared inside a task. So dev system is what we've seen before. Uh, in this case, just a, a database and a web server. Um, it will auto start when you uh, when you launch it. When you tap boot dev, it will do. It will run this pipeline of task, and you have a REPL, You have um, your application running. You have a REPL server. You have a task which uh, watches the, the changes in your in your uh, closure scripts uh, source files. Um, and you have here uh, a hot reload reloading f um, uh, facility, which is granular, uh, and that means that. It will, if you make a change in your source file, it will reload the namespace of the f of the file where you defined your re redefined the function, for example. But if you tell it that it should be uh, restarting the whole system using refresh, then you you put this. You have a vector here, 
called files and you, you put it there and then if you change that file it will do a, a true uh, restart um, using the refresh from uh, tools namespace and uh, restart all your components so um, but you don't need that all, all the time uh, for, for many uh, a classical file that needs to to have as an um, as a side effect the, the restart of the system is the, your handler your ha your web handler because you feed that into the web server <coughs> so anytime you touch this file you want the web server to restart um, but if you're just uh, touching some kind of a, a, a file which uh, which doesn't doesn't have this, this side effect, you can just reload the name and that, that will be fine. So this, will, this is what will happen automatically here. <coughs> so, the, um, the, whole, the um, cumulative effect of this is that you can have an environment where you just write your code and you save your you save your changes and the application restarts as needed and this is the, uh, an interactive environment this is the, ex the interactive experience that you want um, so basically uh, this is this is it uh, I went a little bit fast so uh, maybe uh, you can we can talk about uh, any questions that you might have or um, whatever you want to, to discuss. Thank you.